forward. Oh, hello, hello everybody and welcome to Bulimia Sucks. My name is Kate Hudson Hall and this is Bulimia Sucks. Um, and this is a platform for people to share relatable and uplifting and inspiring conversations based on bulimia, anorexia and other eating disorders. And these are real stories from people who are suffering or have suffered an eating disorder. And episodes will include their personal stories of where they are now and their journeys and steps taken into their recovery and also to professionals who work with people with an eating disorder. Now, my audiobook, Bulimia Sucks, is now live on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes. And so if you would be interested um, and would like a free copy, please email me at katehudsonhall at gmail.com and I can send you the code so then you can download it for free. So let me know, just email me. And also our Patreon platform is now live. So for those of you who don't know what Patreon is, it's a way for our listeners to support us financially and allow us to continue creating content to helping people who are struggling with an eating disorder. So if you are interested in supporting us, then if you go to patreon.com forward slash bulimia sucks, then you can find out more and that would be fantastic. Now I'm very, very excited with our guest today, Anita Johnson. And she is, I'll tell you a little bit about her now. So she is an international speaker, also an author, and also an eating disorder professional. Now Anita has a PhD and she's a clinical psychologist and certified eating disorder specialist and supervisor. And she's been working in the field of women's issues and eating disorders for over 35 years. So she has a lot of knowledge to share with us. And we want to hear it today. And she's also, as I said, an author um, of a best-selling book called Eating in the Light of the Moon and co-creator of the Light of the Moon Cafe, a series of online interactive courses and women's support circles and soul hunger workshops. Oh, we want to hear more about that. And she's developed Hawaii's first inpatient eating disorder program in Honolulu in Hawaii. And she is currently the clinical director of AI Perno, is that how you pronounce it? I porno. It's I porno. Oh, yes, that's what it is, isn't it? Um, in Hawaii, an eating disorders program um, with outpatient programs um, on Oahu. I got that right. <laughs> <laughs> and Hawaii and an oceanfront residential program on Maui. Oh, just incredible. Um and when she set up her ABC, Anorexia Bulimia Center in Hawaii, females from all walks of life would come and join her. And I want to question you about this, Anita, and find out more about the connections of all these multiple different people from different walks of life that came and, and to gain your help and the, what you learned from that and your connection. But anyway, we'll move on to that later. So welcome, Anita. I'm so pleased that you're that you were free to join us today. I'm happy to be here. Thank oh, you. Thank and congratulations on your book. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Now, where shall we begin? There's so much we want to hear from you. So where would you like to begin, Anita? Well, maybe we can begin at the beginning of how I got involved with working with uh people struggling with eating disorders. Yes. Uh, as, as you mentioned, it, it was many years ago, way back in mm, 1982. And I was uh, supervising a psychology intern at University of Hawaii who was doing her doctoral dissertation on eating disorders. Right. And so we would meet and, and we were joined by a third woman who was a social worker 
who had recovered herself from an eating disorder, but, but she had had to figure it all out herself. And so every time we would meet to talk about what was going on, we just kept saying, oh, there's such a big problem here. There should be a center for this. And after we said it for about the fifth time, we looked at each other and we went, I guess we're it. <laughs> we're the center. <laughs> We've got to do this. Right. So we, so we created the Anorexia and Bulimia Center of Hawaii, which has now since morphed into Aipono Hawaii. But back then, we were just learning, right? Uh, bulimia had just been uh, diagnosed, really, in the DSM. Because it was diagnosed that, in 1979, wasn't it? Yeah, so it was fairly recently yeah, that yeah. had come on board. People were starting to understand what anorexia nervosa was because Karen Carpenter, the yeah. singer, had just died from it. Yeah. Binge eating disorder wasn't even heard of. And so, so the three of us, we would get together and just try to figure this out. And what I started to recognize is once we created it, it was one of those things you create it, they come. Uh, like you said, girls, women of all ages, all ethnicities, all sizes, all walks of life started to show up. And in those days, there weren't any men that were, that were coming. And so I was so curious, like, okay, what is it? What is it that these folks have in common that they're struggling? And, and first of all, why is it females? Second of all, why is it these particular girls and women? Yeah. And third, why is the struggle around eating and food and body image? And so uh, I'm a storyteller and as a psychologist, I'm a story listener. So I just started listening as carefully as I could to their stories to see if I could find the, the common denominator or the, yeah, the connection. There. Yeah. And what I discovered is that these girls and women were like the child in the fairy tale, The Emperor's no, New Clothes. And so in that story, you have this very vain emperor. He doesn't care much about ruling his kingdom. He's mostly interested in fine clothing and jewelry. It's, that's not so <laughs> unusual even today, right? Yeah. But anyhow, a, a couple of con artists had heard about him. And so they came into town and they said, oh, we're tailors and our clothing is so fine. Only those good for their station in life can even see it. And so the emperor was very impressed and he commissioned these con artists to create him a whole new wardrobe. And so they pretended to cut and stitch cloth that really wasn't there. But the, all the people who worked for the emperor went on and on about the magnificent clothing because they didn't want to lose their jobs. And even the emperor himself carried on about his fabulous outfits because he didn't want people to think he wasn't fit for his station in life. And so the con artists, they left town laughing all the way to the bank. And then there was this grand procession where the emperor is wearing his new outfit. And all the townspeople are ooing and eyeing about how amazing his clothing is because they didn't want their neighbor to think they were stupid. But there was a child in the crowd who said in a very loud voice, but mommy, the emperor has no clothes on at all. And when this child spoke, it created a ripple throughout the crowd and everyone saw the emperor for the fool that he was. So what I discovered is that these girls and women were like that child in that they had an uncanny ability to perceive subtle realities that others couldn't really see. And what I mean by that is they could read between the lines, see the bigger picture, perceive hypocrisy. They could sense when things were not okay, even if everyone around them said things are just fine. And so what that meant for them is because their lives weren't fairy tales, when they spoke the truth, uh, maybe it was something like, but mommy, when, how come, if daddy loves us, how come he never comes home at night or some such thing? Mm. And, and so they were either ignored or they were maybe ridiculed, um, in some instances even abused for speaking out loud what other people couldn't perceive. And so what had to happen is they had to find some way to dim their light, to diminish this capacity to perceive subtle realities because what they wanted more than anything else, what all of us want more than anything else is a sense of belonging. And they didn't want to be different, but they confused belonging with fitting in, which isn't the same thing. Yeah. So 
the, the role that the eating disorder began to play was to distract them um, from their perceptions, from their intuitions, to, to numb their feelings uh, so that they didn't have to uh, feel so different. So that was, that's how I got started was, was okay, see, let's follow this. Let's follow this thread. Oh, I see. Okay. And then how did you help those women? Um, you know, how, how did the program develop? Well, so we began, we, we, we called it a center without walls because we then began starting to see individuals in our private practice and we would meet every week just to try to figure out what was going on. And so it was, it was for me, it was a matter of helping them come home to their true self and to uh, claim these, the very qualities that, that they were using their eating disorder to try to diminish were the very qualities that would help them in their recovery. Because once you connect to your true authentic self, you basically put the eating disorder out of a job. Yeah. Um, and so you connect with your authentic self through your inner guidance system of your emotions and learning how to work with emotions because most of these individuals were terrified of them um, because they were emotionally sensitive and highly intuitive by nature. Now, the way I see it, I call that being thin skin, but, but uh, those are wonderful qualities to have because I, if, if they're more of our world leaders, for example, were thin skin, I think the world would be better placed because what comes with that is a, a great deal of empathy and compassion, yeah. which yeah. is what we really need now. And so learning how to work with their emotions and understand them, right? Because we are taught in our culture that emotions are things and they're not, that they're, they're forms of energy. So, you know, you can't see them, uh, perceive them with our five senses. You can certainly feel them. And, and so learning that emotions are waves, waves of energy that move through us. They come in, they peak and they pass and they come in, they peak and they pass. But if you don't understand that, then you try to stop them. You try to block them because if you're, if you're emotionally sensitive, what might be no big deal to somebody else penetrates your very bones. Yeah. So the skill of learning how to work with your emotions so that you don't become overwhelmed so that it don't come out sideways um, so that you don't think sideways is a good way are. to explain it. Though. <laughs> yeah, they, you know, they, they spill out all, you know, because you can't control your emotions any more than you can swim up a mountain, right? You can control the way you express them, but the emotions themselves, they have a life of their own. They're a form of energy. They're valuable because they give us important information yeah. about what's okay with us and what's not okay with us and, and what's happening in the world. So you want, you want your emotions and, and it's great being emotionally sensitive unless you don't know how to work with it. Yes. And then the other problem is, is that we live in a world that um, uh, devalues uh, or denies or dismiss, dismisses our emotions. And so if you're emotionally sensitive, who's gonna teach you how to work with them, right? Yeah. And so yeah. that becomes the part of the journey is, is learning how to identify, accept, and express your feelings in a way that honors your experience yeah. and the experience of another person. And this for me is the fundamental recovery skill. Yeah. I, I, in fact, I, I have a course dedicated specifically to learning assertiveness because in the 35 years I've been working with eating disorders, I've never ever, ever seen anyone recover. And I've seen thousands recover totally, completely recovered. It's a done deal. It's over. Uh, right. It's totally possible, but not without this skill. And yeah. so um, I, uh, that's one of the things that I would do with someone is I would just yeah. teach them. It's a language. It's, it's, it's a language that we're not taught, most of us. Yeah. Uh, I remember when I was in, in the depths of my eating disorder, mm -hmm. so I had bulimia and anorexia for 15 years. When I was in the depths, I had no idea what a feeling was. Yeah. Never talked about them. 
denial, complete yeah. denial of my feelings. And didn't want to know, right? No, I didn't know what was going on. No, I thought I was just going mad. So exactly. yeah, I totally, you know, I totally, fully yeah. support that. Yeah. Because yeah, so that there, there are skills a person needs to learn in order to recover. And mm-hmm. one of the ways I like to explain it, because I work with a lot of metaphors and storytelling, because I found that's a way to help understand some pretty complex concepts and so um i i often use this metaphor of imagine imagine you're on the banks of a raging river it's pouring down rain you slip you fall in you're drowning you're getting pulled down through the rapids and along comes a big log and you grab on and the log saves your life it it, it keeps your head above water when surely you would have drowned And eventually it carries you to a place in the river where the water is calm and you can see the riverbank over there, but you can't get there because of the log, because you're holding on to the log. So the irony is the very thing that saved your life is getting in the way of you going where you want to go in life. And that's the eating disorder. It, It has served a function, an important function, and it would behoove you to find out what that function is. Because to make it more complicated, there's always someone on the riverbank yelling, let go of the log, let go of the log. And you feel like an absolute idiot because you can't let go of the log. Well, the way I see it is letting go of that log may not be the best thing to do initially. Because what happens if you let go of the log, start to swim to shore, get halfway there and realize, oh, shoot, I don't have the strength to make it. Well, that means you don't have the strength to make it back to the log either, and you're really sunk. So I believe that we all have a wise part of ourselves that will not, will not let us let go of anything until we're good and ready. So what do you do instead? Let go of the log and try floating. When you start to sink, grab back on. Let go of the log and try treading water. When you get tired, grab back on. Let go of the log, swim around it once and grab back on twice, 10 times, 100 times, 200 times, whatever it takes for you to have the strength and confidence to let go of the log. Then you let go. And so so the idea is that, first of all, there's nothing wrong with you. Um, You're not broken. You're not damaged goods. It's that you were going through some really tough intense emotional currents and you needed to grab onto something to stay afloat good for you however you can't live your life holding onto a log as everyone has discovered right but in order to let go you need skills yeah. um and, and so this kind of introduces that idea oh, i love it the skills and the tools to be able to mm-hmm. to get to shore Mm -hmm, Exactly. Because you put the eating disorder again out of a job. It serves a function, but you need to find out what is that function. So let's say someone doesn't know how to set boundaries. And so what happens is everyone around them acts as though their personal, their physical, their emotional, their spiritual space is just someplace else for them to walk. Well, that's the distress that that causes is immense. And so so one of the functions of an eating disorder is that it's something that you keep secret. It's something that you do in private. It's So now you've built some boundaries around yourself. Well, but they're not the most effective, efficient boundaries because They're essentially walls and walls can protect you, but they also imprison you. So someone in that situation would need to learn how to set boundaries with other people and say, well, you know, that may be okay with you, but that's not okay with me. Or you may want me to do blah, 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 but really I want to do blah, blah, blah. And so that's a skill. And anyone can learn these skills, by the way, you don't need some special talent or some special DNA. They're just skills. And, And the thing about skills is they take practice to be sure but, but you can do this. And so the, the message I want to give to your listeners is total, complete recovery is absolutely possible, but that there are some skills that a person who is emotionally sensitive, highly intuitive, um, thin-skinned, needs to learn in order to live in our thick-skinned world. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. That Because that's just such a 
I think for people that is kind of a, to hear you say that this is where you are, yes, and we see that, mm -hmm. but you've just learned some really unhelpful ways to be able to cope with difficulties that you've had in your life. Yeah. And you just yeah. need to change and, and learn new tools mm -hmm. because um, I don't know for people too much, but for my clients and for me, when they're in the mist and depths of that eating disorder, it's huge. It's an act, a, absolutely it's like huge um, difficulty, obviously, but it's just kind of engulfing. But to hear what you said there, that actually it's just, you know, it's just the way that you're coping with it at the moment. Exactly. And you need some new tools to be able to move on. Exactly. It's kind of taking that heavy weight away from how many people may be listening feel because it, you know, you can get over it and you can, you know, you can get gain full recovery. Yeah. More than that, here's what's really cool about it is that once you learn these skills, they're gonna serve you the rest of your life, long after the eating disorder has passed. And not only that, but the way I look at recovery, recovery isn't going back to who you were before the eating disorder. No, recovery is moving into and stepping into a life beyond your wildest dreams. Yeah. Because that's where these skills take you. So it's really a way of moving forward and I, I, I talk with people all the time that have recovered. Uh, often they're kind enough to give me um, testimonials for the Light of the Moon Cafe. And their stories are incredible and what they're doing. And I believe this. I believe this with every fiber in my being because I've been doing this long enough to, to see this. That those who struggle with eating disorders and get on their recovery path are the people the world has been waiting for because they bring a level of compassion and empathy, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. I said earlier, that we need right now. We desperately need. And, and you're, you're an example of that, right? It's yeah. Like and so many of the girls that I speak to, they are now therapists mm -hmm. of some sort and help people with eating disorders. And there's just an incredible underlying connection between us all that yes. has been there Beautiful. and recovered. Yes. And it's, it's, you know, it's overwhelming. And it's just, I've, yes. I'm doing like, I'm having so much fun meeting exactly. all of these incredible girls and they're hearing their journeys and then learning where they are because exactly. they've not gone back. No. They've not gone back to where they were. They've no. moved forward and flourished. Totally. And, and because, you know, and developing an eating disorder, it is a an attempt to survive. And when, when you get the skills you need, you don't have to survive, you can thrive. Yeah. And, and it doesn't mean you have to do something, you know, spectacular. It means that maybe you can be an incredible mother or grandmother to, to uh, a, a child or to a a niece or nephew, or, or it means that maybe you can provide a level of understanding and support to somebody else who's struggling with something. It may not even be an eating disorder, but yeah. you know what struggle feels like and you ha can have compassion for that. So, so it's really extraordinary. Uh, uh, and I feel blessed to be a part of the journey because I get to see these things. Yes. And that's why actually, that's why I created the Light of the Moon Cafe, because it's an online course with women from all over the world. Right. And they get to hear what I get to hear. So when someone makes a comment, there's a there's a forum. And so every day there's a, an activity, maybe a story or a poem, and then people start sharing their stories. And all the participants get to hear what I get to hear all the time, these amazing, incredible, insightful, powerful, compassionate women. And, it, and so it, the recovery process is exponential when you realize you're not all alone with this. And not only that, there's other people who are absolutely fabulous that are also struggling with an eating disorder. Yes. So it's not a matter that you're you're damaged or broken. It's that this is something that worked for you for a short period of time, but because you haven't developed something else, you've clung to it and it's it's not helpful any longer. Oh, 
just it's so inspiring for us all even though I'm recovered I'm inspired because it, it you know we're talking about eating disorders here but that is you know that's just such a perfect metaphor for anyone that's struggling in any sort of addiction or any sort of difficulty they're having it's their way of coping worrying. yeah you yeah mean. the anxiety oh that is a huge problem isn't it at the moment mm -hmm. oh so tell us about the cafe oh okay so i created it gosh it's been about almost eight or ten years now with a colleague of mine who was a dietitian and i had been doing a lot of traveling uh doing soul hunger workshops and and she had started running uh, eating in the light of the moon support groups but we could not there were too many people we couldn't I, you know, I could only go so many places and her groups kept filling up. She was kept creating new groups and they kept filling up. And so one day she said, Anissa, do you think we could create this kind of soulful, heartfelt connection online? And I went, gosh, I have no idea, but I'm willing to try. And so we spent a year putting together like our best activities and and, and our ideas. And so we created the Light of the Moon Cafe. And and it's, there, there's a series of different groups uh, of interactive groups where for eight weeks, for example, every day in your email inbox, you would get a new activity. And it might be like, okay, the first day might be, all right, we're reading chapter seven in Eating in the Light of the Moon. And then the next day would be a poem. And then the next day would be me telling a story uh, from that a book, a fairy tale. And then maybe the next day would be some questions about that story to see how it applies personally to your life. And then the next day might be an, a metaphor, like the, the log metaphor. I have a whole bunch of those yeah. to help people understand things. And then the next day would be a list of a playlist of inspiring songs to listen to, or there might be, and then there might be a writing or a drawing activity. And so then on the forum, because it's people from all over the world, you can go to the forum at three o'clock in the morning and see what people's reaction was to this poem and maybe post your own if you feel like it. And then I respond to every single comment and uh, question. So I'm on there all the time too. Oh, so wow. I, I was amazed because the people connect and they get the support. And I, I did, you know, this was like I said, eight or 10 years ago. So I didn't know if it was possible to do this online. And I have to say it is, and it brings me so much joy because, you know, I'm in there chiming in all the time, but these other women, the way they support each other is just incredible because someone might say, oh my gosh, you just took the words out of my mouth. Or someone else would say, oh, I never thought of it that way. That really yeah. makes sense. And so it's a way that you can have your privacy because you're, you're anonymous. You can post a picture of yourself or your dog or a rose or whatever, uh, but and share as much or as little as you want. But everyone gets the benefit of knowing you're not alone. And there's some pretty cool people that are also struggling as well. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, can, so can anybody connect? Okay, so, connect? so the how does it work? So the interactive courses are actually courses. They begin at a certain time and they end at a certain time. So I have one that's starting right now. It's just started. Uh, and um, it, it, even if you're a week late, it's no problem. You can always catch up. Even if you have to go on holiday and miss a week or so, you can, you can always catch up. You can't go forward. You can't get the next course before the next um, activity for everybody else but you can always go back and review and 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 like I say catch up if you missed something some people like to do the activities every day other people like to wait to the end of the week and then do them all at once so so, you, would, so would they be sent in their inbox mm -hmm. like you did before so daily activities for them to do right. so they can right. save them all and do them at the end of the week okay and then right. how many weeks is it Eight, the eight, there's a series of three courses and the beginning course is eight weeks. Okay. Oh, wow. So yeah. So, so then there's, I also have the self-study courses and they're available at any time. So I have one called Cracking the Hunger Code, which is one of the most fun things I love to do because when you understand that whatever your struggle is, is coming from a part of yourself that's trying to communicate something 
metaphorically, um, then you can crack the code and find out really what's been the function of your eating disorder so you can develop the skills. And, uh, and so there's a, there's a metaphor I like to use for that. And I'll share this with your yes, yes. listeners right now. Yeah, yeah. So uh, again, we always notice, we always begin with imagine because your imagination is your superpower. Yeah. And some people say, well, I don't have a good imagination. And I like to say, well, what do you think worry is, <laughs> right? <laughs> worry is a bad use. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm sure you're very good at that one. <laughs> right. That's so, your imagination. Yeah. So um, ima uh, imagine you have two tanks. Tank A and tank B is what we're gonna call them. Tank A is the tank you fill when you need physical nourishment and you fill it with food. Tank B is the tank you feel when you need emotional or spiritual nourishment and you fill it with what I call soul food. And that is attention, affection, appreciation, meditation, prayer, and so on. But what happens to most of us because of the culture we live in, we think there's just one tank. So before we know it, tank A is full and overflowing, but we're still hungry. Or maybe we don't even wanna begin to fill tank A because it seems like the bottomless pit and will never stop, so, so we restrict. And so what has to happen is you have to tease the two tanks apart. Uh, and the way you do that is through one of the recovery skills, is, which is interoceptive awareness which is learning how to identify your internal state. So like if, uh, if you say my head is uh, pounding or my heart is racing or my stomach is growling, that's interoceptive awareness, right? You're tuning in yeah. to see what's going on inside. Uh, finding your hunger and satiety signals is interoceptive awareness. Mm. So the way you tease them apart is learning um, what the physical sensations are in your body of mm. hunger, physical hunger and what the physical sensations are in your body uh, for fullness. Yes. And so that's a skill that, 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 that um, I teach and, and dietitians teach and you learn how to identify that. So for the purposes of, of our discussion, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna imagine that everybody knows their hunger and satiety signals. And let's say you're reaching for the pizza and you check in, not a hunger signal in sight, you still want to eat that pizza, right? Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? Now you've tumbled down Alice in Wonderland's rabbit hole and landed smack dab in tank B. And in tank B, pizza is not pizza. Food is not food. What is it? It's a concrete physical symbol of another kind of hunger that you're experiencing and probably don't even know about. Mm -hmm. But it's coded that what happens is the food is talking to you. It's trying to tell you this, but it's talking in code. And in order to understand what's being said, you have to crack the code. So I'm gonna give you a brief idea of how to do that for your listeners. You don't have to scribble this down. If you want uh, to get a PDF, uh, download a PDF copy of this, all you have to do is go to lightofthemooncafe.com forward slash BS for bulimia sucks. And you can, <laughs> you can download this. So, and I will put the link for that below. Oh, great. So, so it goes yeah, something so like this. So people can find it easy. Yeah. Sweet foods have to do usually with feeling like there's not enough sweetness in your life, or maybe you're not sweet enough. Crunchy, salty foods are typically associated with unexpressed anger and frustration, like you want to bite someone's head off, right? Yeah. Warm foods typically are connected for, to a craving for emotional warmth. Spicy foods, and again, this is either a fear of or a craving for. Yes. Spicy foods have to do with either excitement, stimulation, and change. And chocolate, we know this from Valentine's Day, right? <laughs> Love, romance, sensuality, sexuality. Yep. And so, so to give you an idea of how this works, I was working with a client who struggled with bulimia. And I said to her, I said, okay, if there were any food you wished you could have eaten and there were no consequences, absolutely no consequences, what would that be? And she said, oh, it would be vanilla ice cream with strawberries on top. And I said, okay, I want you to imagine I've never had vanilla ice cream with strawberries on top and you're gonna tell me what's so fabulous about it. 
and she said, it's sweet, it's smooth, and it's refreshing. When we took a look at what was going on in her life, her boyfriend was accusing her of not being sweet enough. She, had, she was in a dead end job, really in need of a refreshing change. And um, she had hit a really rough patch with her parents and was wanting desperately for things to smooth out. One food, lots to work with, right? Yes, so this is yes. kind of how it works. It's really, there's something almost magical about it when you uh, start to crack the code. And, and, it, and, and because we know recovery can sometimes be grueling and painful, this is a part of the recovery that actually is kind of fun. You go, oh my God, who would have thought? Um, and, and, and it's even kind of funny when you, when you get it. So for example, sometimes it's even the language itself. I was working remotely because I do individual sessions and uh, with a woman who was actually, she was in London and she was working for a, um, a startup company and she was always, always um, late for our session. She would come flying in, her hair would be flying, she's, or she'd be texting me, she's okay, I'm on the train, I'm almost there. And so she came in and she said, oh my gosh, I'm so upset. I had this huge binge and I just, I, 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 you know, I'm so distressed. And I said, well, what was going on that day that, that you binge? And she said, well, my company, she worked for a, this tech startup and they were having a crowdfunding. And if they didn't make their goal, the company was going to fold. And I went, ooh, that's stressful. Mm -hmm. And I said, did you, and I said, did, did you make it? And she goes, we did. And I said, did you know that um, when you binged? And she said, no, we hadn't, we hadn't known that yet. So I said, okay. And I said, so um, afterwards, did, and she, she said, I'm so embarrassed though, because what I binge on, I put ketchup on everything. And, 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 and it has to be sweet and I put ketchup on it. And I went, okay. I said, so when you made the deadline, did the company, did you have a celebration? How, how did that go? She goes, oh no, my boss said, okay, we're really behind. Now we're just gonna have to catch up. And I went, isn't that your life? You're always having to catch up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so because it was a metaphor and it clicked, it doesn't always click, but when it clicks, boom, something happens and you're able to make shifts that you weren't able to make before once you get what this is about. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's incredible. Fun. Incredible, fun. but it really makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So your book, Eating in the Light of the Moon, mm -hmm. so is it, um, so it's based on what you teach now? So it is. It's well, it's a little different because it's fairy tales and folk tales from around the world that because there's amazing wisdom embedded in these tales. Right. Mm -hmm. They've been passed on some of the tales like like Beauty and the Beast. They've done research. There's six thousand years old. I mean, these are old stories. And there's a reason why they've been passed down. Uh, in the beginning, it was just orally from generation to generation. Now we can we can read them because the Grimm's fairy tales, for example, um, it was a collection by a couple of young guys. They're only like in their twenties, and they went around in Germany and they they collected all these stories from uh, mostly young women. Interesting, they had a younger sister that uh, had friends that had these stories, and so now we think of them as the Grimm's fairy tales. But they didn't write these stories. So embedded in these stories is amazing amount of wisdom. But again, it's just like with the food, you have to crack the code. It's that the communication is in symbolic language. It's in metaphoric language. Yeah. So I use um, fairy tales and folk tales from around the world to explain the concepts that underlie the struggle with disordered eating. Right. And then I created Light of the Moon Cafe as an, it's more like an interactive workbook or maybe a women's circle uh, where we take each chapter and then go much deeper and can get very specific about anyone's particular struggle. Because wow. for years, people had asked me to do a workbook and every time I thought about it, it just did not inspire me at all until this friend of mine, my colleague said, how about an online workbook? And I went, yeah. 
that would be interesting because it would be interactive and I could participate. And uh, so I got really excited about it and, and, and I still am. I love it. I love the work. I love it. And so your courses, so you teach, do you do teach them once a year? Well, the, the beginning course, which is called the new crescent moon, uh, like I said, it starts this coming week. Um, and then there's a, a second one for people who want to continue and a third one. And so then the next beginning one wouldn't be again until uh, 2022. Uh, and so if I can squeeze in two of them a year, I'm doing good because right. it, it's time consuming for me because I'm there. I'm at the cafe. Yeah, online. But the, yes, but the self-study courses are available at any time. And so one of them is Cracking the Hunger Code, where you learn how to work with the metaphor like that I just talked about. Yeah, yeah. And the other is the assertiveness course, which is the, that, ascent, that I believe is the essential recovery skill. And so I'm in the process of creating more courses because it's a fun way for me to get the information out there. Uh, yeah. If I can only be in so many places at, at a time. Yeah. So those two courses, how many weeks are they? How do they work? They're, they can take, you can, you can spend five years if you want, or five minutes. It's a self-study. So it, what it is, what those two courses are, they're a series of videos and a downloadable workbook. And so I explain the concepts in the videos and then um, you get to apply them, uh, see how they apply to yourself in the workbook. Wow. Oh gosh. I love it. And so where would people go to be able to um, find all the information out? Is that on your website? You can go either to my website, which is dranitajohnston.com or the other website where all the courses are is lightofthemooncafe.com. Okay, good. And like, like we said before, well, I'll put all the links below. So Anita, so, um, so if there was somebody listening to this, um, and they were thinking about taking that first step onto their recovery path, what would you say to them? What I would say is, it's possible. Mm. There are skills you're going to need to learn along the way. But as I said earlier, these are skills that are going to benefit you the rest of your life. So it's really worth learning these skills. Um, and that... Uh, I've seen thousands, I know thousands of people because <laughs> I've been doing this for so long, right? But I know thousands of people that have totally completely recovered. And I know it because some of these people are close friends of mine, some are colleagues. They don't even struggle with food obsessions or, or body obsessions. It's gone, it's done because it's sort of like a weed. If you just cut it off at the top, which is what happens if you try just to get rid of the symptoms, yeah. then given the right circumstances, it's going to come back. But if you go down, find the roots and eradicate them, it's a done deal. It's over. Oh, what a fantastic, another fantastic metaphor there. <laughs> you can tell I speak in metaphor. <laughs> no, it's great because we all understand it. <laughs> but it, it just explains it in more easier terms, I suppose, for a lot of people. Well, it does for me. It helps me understand it. And so it helps me communicate it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is just, oh, it's heartwarming. I'm so excited. Um, and so, um, and where, well, you've got your course coming up now. Um, and what about the future for you? Future for me, um, I'm not sure exactly where I'm going with this. I, I, I love what I do so much, but the problem is I can only do so much. So I have a residential treatment program in Hawaii. And before COVID, I was uh, uh, there every, every other month. So now I do a lot of Zoom. I Zoom the groups, I Zoom the treatment team meeting. And I also uh, have another program I consult with in Tennessee. So um, I'm busy with that. I'm, I'm writing a new book, but it's really in the beginning stages. I, I started doing that. I started setting a day a week aside uh, during COVID just to, to entertain myself. Um, I, I, I really would like once 
once the world starts behaving itself, <laughs> I would like to start uh, doing soul hunger workshops again. I travel all over the world doing these and that's always fun for me. So um, if I, in the past, if I would get uh, an email saying, hey, will you come here? And I said, well, I can show up if someone can arrange it. Someone yeah. can put it all together, I'll be there. So I love doing that. And, and that I think I think that's what I would like to do more because I've been tethered like everybody else for a while. So yes, I'm we're ready to get out, aren't we? <laughs> so, there, so that's you teaching a workshop. Yeah, right? it can be a day long or a weekend uh, retreat, essentially a workshop of, of uh, in women in the, I, I like to use the format of a woman's circle. And uh, okay. so that's always been just a lot of fun. Yeah. Oh, wow. Gosh, Anita, so much information for us all to take in and learn and learn from you. And we need to come and find you to learn more. Oh, I'm so pleased you could join us today. Oh, well, thank you so much. Thank you. This was a pleasure. This is what I love doing. And I love that you're doing this also. Yes, I'm really enjoying it. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Anita. So that's all for today's episode of Bulimia Sucks. And thank you to everybody for listening and join us again on the next episode. Um, and make sure that you subscribe to the podcast on Apple iTunes so you never miss an episode. Plus, if you haven't already heard about my book, check it out, Bulimia Sucks, on Amazon to learn many different techniques to help you to begin to break through your painful bulimic behaviors. And so make sure also that you come and join our Facebook group where it's great to connect with like-minded people. And we can all learn from each other. So thanks for listening. And I look forward to speaking to you in the next episode.